Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features The Uncanny X-Men number 224, cover dated December 1987. So this cover here is uh, by Mark Silvestri and Bob Wyacek. Silvestri had become the Uncanny X-Men series regular penciler with issue 218. And I'm taking a look at, in this and subsequent videos, the fall of the mutants storyline. So this issue is kind of the preview issue. It's a quiet issue. There isn't very much that happens, but um, at the end of this issue, uh, we get a sense of what uh, the fall of the mutants is going to be about somewhat. Um, on the cover, uh, we have Havoc um, blasting a convertible Cadillac with a bunch of random thugs uh, driving it and Longshot uh, rescuing uh, this uh, random woman who had been abducted by the thugs. Um, so it's, uh, it's a development of um, a scene from the interior of uh, the issue itself. Now, opening up um, this particular issue, we have, there's a card insert here that's advertising um, uh, Excalibur, a new um, uh, spin-off series by Chris Claremont, Alan Davis and Paul Neary that was coming out um, at the end of 1987. And if I just put that to one side, uh, we see here this excellent splash page by Mark Silvestri. We have our creative team here, Chris Claremont, Mark Silvestri, uh, spelt wrong with a K, Bob Wyacek, guest in inker, and I think Wyacek does an excellent job on Silvestri here, um, guesting in place of series regular Dan Green. The colorist is Glynis Oliver and the letterer um, Tom Orzekowski. So Storm, this story picks up from um, the previous issue where Storm is on a quest to take down Forge and she is um, in the company of Forge's former um, mentor, uh, Naze, um, a medicine man of the um, Cheyenne um, tribe or people. And um, this particular um, scene takes place in um, Yellowstone Park, National Park, Wyoming. So Storm has donned um, um, traditional Cheyenne garb that uh, Naze has given her. And over the page, and I'm gonna have to hold this open with my hands because that card insert is um, interfering with the flat lay of the pages. So Storm is dialoguing with Naze about um, what is happening with um, Forge and um, and he's uh, talking about um, uh, uh, the, uh, the adversary, the great trickster, um, and his plan uh, to consume everything in one big energy burst. No more people, no more life, no more anything, it's dead. And Storm is horrified, why would he do such a thing? Fun maybe, replies um, Naze. We're mortal, Zororo. He's a god. Who can figure his motives? Um, Storm twigs that Naze, in the way he talks about the adversary, admires him. And he responds, I, I appreciate brass and style. He is both. So do you. So they find themselves at uh, Forge's Mountain Eyrie. And Storm is going to have to go it alone. Uh, climb the mountain and face Forge. Uh, because Naze says... Um, he can't come any closer because Forge is expecting him. His alarms and defenses are keyed to Naze um, personally, but he won't hardly know that she, Storm, is there. And so Storm knows what her role is to slay Forge. And this storyline goes all the way back to Life Death Part 1 on Canny X Men 186, where um, Storm and Forge's fraught relationship. Um, um, begins. Um, Forge is responsible for the loss of her powers, which is still the case um, in this issue. She does not have access to her weather powers. And also in that issue, they fell in love. 
um, but Storm um, found or, or believed that Forge had betrayed her um, to um, to the government. Um, so as Aurora makes ready to um, ascend the mountain and face Forge and slay him, um, Naze gives her a hug and then a cheeky kiss here, uh, which seems to um, impress Storm. And she says, it's a memory she'll cherish until her return. Naze replies, hope you do. And then when she's out of earshot, but I wouldn't count on it. Me, I don't much care either way what happens, just so long as when the game is over, I win. So there has something, there's something up with Naze, and this has been revealed to the reader in previous issues, but we're not quite 100% sure what his deal exactly is at this point. Something else to note here, this is very strong work by Silvestri. Silvestri's on record as saying that the kind of um, drawing he prefers is without straight lines, so he likes uh, this kind of background, the natural landscape, um, it plays to his strengths. He's not a big fan of using straight edges um, when he's drawing. Okay, so then the scene uh, switches to San Francisco and um, a media interview with Dr. Eva Dr. Valerie Cooper, um, who is presenting Freedom Force as um, a solution to um, terrorist uh, actions, such as the recent battle between the X-Men and the Marauders. So standing beside her flank, um, on either side of her is Destiny and Crimson Commando. And the media is skeptical. The media basically points out, well, um, w these, these are uh, convicted criminals. And she responds, well, they're, um, they're paying off their debt to society. And by working for Freedom Force, they're going to earn a pardon. Um, and, um, and she also talks about uh, the pending um, mutant uh, uh, registration act and um, she is um, uh, talking that up as um, something that will be helpful for national defense but the media figures ask has the administration considered the civil liberties ramifications of this new law and her response is, what about the civil liberties of the staff and patients of this hospital that was wrecked by the fight between the X-Men and the Marauders? Yes, the act may curtail the rights of a few, but this is a case where the good of society, the defense of the many must take precedence. Except the whole point of democracy contends, uh, this reporter is to pr protect the few from the many and so on and so forth. And this is classic for from Claremont where you get um, debates and discussions um, in his mature writing where he presents the strongest case on the one side and a strong case on the other side against it. So it's really left up to the reader to make up their own mind um, in respect of um, uh, things like the Mutant Registration Act, um, the, uh, the curtailment of civil liberties um, implied by that and so on and so forth. Claremont lets the reader decide for themselves. Um, then over the page, we the, the scene shifts, but there's a nice little device whereby um, Valerie Cooper continues with her speech on television, and but we're at a gym in San Francisco where Rogue has a private workout and she is um, pumping iron, um, lifting 47.05 tons uh, to the uh, shock of the gym owner. And um, she's interrupted in the middle, middle of her workout by this character here, uh, who turns out to be um, Mystique, her foster mother. And Mystique has come to her with a warning that uh, Destiny, who's a precognitive, um, whose power is pre precognition, has seen the X-Men die in Dallas. And she's come to tell Rogue uh, to, um, to warn her of that and to come away with her and avoid that fate. But um, Rogue responds, they're my friends, Mystique. She cares for them as much as she cares for Mystique and she can't and she won't walk out on them. So a little um, emotional uh, moment there between foster mother and daughter. And then our scene shifts again. It's the nighttime of that same day and Alison Blair, aka Dazzler, is um, playing in um, a particular nightclub called Deviate in the Mission District of San Francisco. 
and the crowd are loving it and uh but a drunk hits the um uh the um uh, shorts circuits the um electricity and allison compensates using her um light powers and so the crowd crowd really enjoys it but who's there in the background in the shadows watching it's wolverine having a smoke and wolverine says to her hate to spoil things ali but you better start figuring how much this will cost you're a mutant dazzler and an x-man going public with your powers like you just did may not have been the smartest of plays especially when the team's trying to keep a low prof profile and this seeds something that is coming in future issues uh, this thought that the x-men um, play their role uh, most successfully when um, when they keep out of public view and when they keep a low profile so um, rogue arrives and um, reveals uh, what was told her by mystique and then the scene shifts to havoc and longshot um, a recent new member of the x-men team um, who are emerging from the cinema they've been to see this film that's a play on uh, the two first indiana jones movies raiders of the lost ark and the temple of doom and um, this is a film in wh which um, longshot himself um, starred well well had a role in as a stuntman it was all dealt with in um, the longshot miniseries um, issue number two specifically um, <clears throat> of that series so longshot longshot is um, pumped um, after watching the film he enjoyed it and um, and um, havoc is uh, less uh, um, cheerful because um, his girlfriend uh, Lorna Dane Polaris um, has joined the Mara Marauders and um, indeed um, is their leader of sorts with Mr. Sinister in the in the deep background. So as they're walking along after coming out of the cinema, these thugs shoot some um, police officers and hop in this uh, Cadillac and kidnap uh, this uh, woman um, on the street. So long shot. Um, thinks that they need to do something about this because they're um, because they're hero heroes and so he leaps into action um, uh, throwing his um, blades to uh, um, spike uh, the uh, the wheels of the Cadillac and um, Havoc ultimately gets involved using his um, his own mutant powers the projection of energy plasma in a highly excited state as he says to melt their car melt that cadillac um as he says to them i melted your car i can do the same to you and basically they give up so uh, the woman that uh, longshot has rescued is um has fallen in love with him uh, to his bemusement um in the background there so then the uh, scene switches to what is the X-Men's temporary hideout at this time, which is uh, the um, uh, is Alcatraz, uh, the island, um, uh, the former um, island prison um, in um, San Francisco Bay, uh, but which is which has been abandoned, and so the X-Men are able to hide out there, even with their Blackbird plane there, and Wolverine is. Um, who is the team leader in the absence of storm um is wondering what to do next he's determined uh, to stay away from dallas first of all um and yet they um they're uh, wondering um what to do what to do about um storm whether they should disband or not and they decide to stick together, all of them, Havoc, Psylocke, Longshot, um, Dazzler, and even Madeline Pryor, um, who has joined them and who is going to be the pilot of their Blackbird, Blackbird plane. Um, Psylocke contacts or attempts to contact Storm telepathically to warn her, uh, to pass on the warning from Mystique. And... Um, and when we turn over the page, Storm, who is climbing uh, the mountain, 
to uh, to find Forge at its summit. Here's something mentally. What I thought I heard someone call my name, but she thinks it's the wind. And then this weirdness um, starts happening. This black lightning, rock falls, and then these demons that fly down from the mountain summit. We also have here noteworthy um, a full page ad for the upcoming storyline, The Fall of the Mutants, uh, with this illustration by uh, Alan Davis and Paul, Paul Neary, showing all the most familiar mutants from Excalibur, um, X-Men, X-Factor, New Mutants, um, apparently dead. Okay. And, um, and so Storm, without her powers, is hugely concerned that these demons are going to... Um, are going to kill her but they have no physical substance and they pass right through her so she continues to climb she makes it uh, to a more level uh, ground uh, but then is attacked by these demons who suddenly now possess form and substance but she uses her knife um, to defend herself and she does well against them also to note here uh, the way that um, Sylvester is drawing these demons it's um, it is um, prescient in relation to his creation of the darkness and um, and indeed even before that the way he drew um, demons in the inferno storyline coming in a year's time so storm anyway does well against these demons um, despite her lack of powers in these pages uh, nicely illustrated once again by Silvestri and um, and she makes her way to the very top of the mountain where she finds Forge. And um, Forge is um, happy to see her, but she of course is of the belief that he's responsible for uh, the demons and that he is intending um, to destroy the world. And so she fulfills her um, mission and stabs him with the blade and says to him that she's doing so in order to put an end to this madness the gate you seek to open would have destroyed the world i cannot allow that and then he replies to her um, faintly you're wrong i was trying to close the gate not destroy the world storm but save it so there's a huge twist here and um and she believes him and forge kicks them both off uh, the side of the precipice and uh, the, the, um, the narration dialogue tells us yet before they can even begin to fall they are consumed their fiery essences are immediately drawn upwards into the gaping maw of the gateway leaving not the slightest trace they had ever been so they're apparently dead at least they've disappeared and Naze um, destroys Forge's airy and um, concludes talking to himself not too shabby if I do say so myself and the fun's only just begun you played your part to perfection Wind Rider you and Forge were the only two capable of stopping me and with you both gone the world is mine for as long as, it's la as it lasts so the next issue 225 is a double sized issue and we're going to get Everything that was set up in this issue uh, ratcheted up to a higher pitch and um, stay tuned for that particular upcoming video. So if you like this video, please like the video and if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.